Okay, social investment. It can mean many, many different things. And one of the reasons for that is because the word social can mean different things. The word investment can mean different things. What constitutes a return can mean different things. Uh, what sort of time frame we uh, bring to bear in thinking about an investment uh, can have different implications. And we can have a different view of social investment depending on whether we're looking at it through the lens of a particular agency or department uh, or provider, uh, or whether we're taking a more holistic view and looking at the kind of uh, the wider uh, implications for society. And I've got a slide here which is probably not very easy to see at the back, but which basically just tries to summarize um, how, depending on how we interpret these words, social investment, return and so on, how we can have a very different view of what social investment might mean. Uh, so very quickly, you know, social could be thought of as simply a contribution to a specific social goal, which might be uh, reducing poverty, it might be reducing um, family violence or something like that. Or social could be something of a much broader nature. It could be thought of in terms of uh, achieving greater societal well-being at a, at, a, at a broad level. The word investment, likewise, can be interpreted in different ways. At a narrow level, it can be interpreted as something which generates a narrow, if you like, economic return, which builds a, an economic asset, which then delivers future, future returns of some kind. At the broader level of the spectrum, uh, uh, an investment could be seen as any kind of, kind of policy investment, including a regulatory policy change, uh, which produces a net benefit of some kind um, to society. The idea of return here, uh, at, a, at a narrow level, it could be simply a fiscal or economic return, a monetary return of some kind, a return to the crown or return uh, more broadly, but narrowly in the sense of economic. Or a return could be thought of in, in, in relation to collective intergenerational well-being, to use a term of one of my colleagues at Victoria University, in which you're thinking about the, the benefit to the whole of the society, the collective, and you're also thinking intergenerationally, not just uh, over the next few years or so. Likewise, the time frame could be short or long, uh, the institutional focus should be narrow or broad, and so on. And so depending on how we interpret these words, social investment return and so on. We could have very, very different um, approaches to social investment. And one of the things that has been evident over the last six or seven years in this country is that the notion of social investment in New Zealand uh, has broadened at least a little bit uh, during that time. Okay, a brief comment just about welfare states and the various models of social investment internationally. As I mentioned, the idea of social investment goes back uh, almost a century uh, to the 1930s in, in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, the social investment model through a Scandinavian uh, lens as it emerged, particularly in the post-war period and, and beyond, focused very much on uh, developing human capital. It was about developing society through uh, better education, uh, better skills, a better miss, a better matching of skills to, to societal needs, to the needs of the economy, and so on and so on. It focused very much on active labour market policies, on, on educational interventions, um, on having effective tax welfare systems, and so on. That model has, uh, partly through the membership of, the, of most of the Scandinavian countries in the European Union, been taken on uh, within the European Union context. So when you read about social investment in Europe, uh, it's very much this idea of focusing on the building of human capital, quite different to the way social investment has been interpreted in this part of the world. So let me say a few words about social investment here in New Zealand. I want to say just a little bit about the context in which the social investment approach kind of emerged, particularly under this government uh, six or seven years ago. I want to talk briefly about its, its features, how it's evolved, and then talk about some of the issues. And I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, the context. You'll all be familiar with this. Um, the current government was elected in the context of the global financial crisis uh, and, and then a series of major earthquakes in Canterbury. This put a, a particular premium on um, trying to uh, restrain government expenditure and find ways of delivering services more cost effectively. Um, that led on, as you know, amongst other things, to the government setting some better public service targets in July 2012, 10 targets which were updated recently. Uh, most of those targets focused on the social sector in various ways. Some of them were quite narrow, some of them were a little bit broader, uh, none of them were very broad. I suggested the government should have targets for reducing poverty uh, when I 
co-chaired the expert advisory group on solutions to child poverty, but the current government hasn't taken up that suggestion. We also had the formation, uh, as I'm sure many of you will remember, in 2010 of the, of the Welfare Working Group, um, which produced a report on how to reduce long-term welfare dependence. That report gave particular emphasis to using actuarial models in uh, thinking about <clears throat> the design of welfare uh, uh, arrangements, particularly for people on benefits. And so that was another kind of key point in the evolution of policy here. Uh, obviously, over the last um, several decades, but particularly in recent years, there's been a, a tremendous focus on vulnerable children, which we uh, were reflecting on to some degree in the most recent session led by Pru. And that has also obviously influenced uh, the design of policies in recent times. Uh, aside from that, and quite independently, there's been the development of so-called big data, uh, more advanced data analytics, data matching, and all that, which has provided new opportunities for assessing uh, the effectiveness of various kinds of policy interventions, uh, albeit there remain serious difficulties, which I'll come to shortly. And, and, and then there's been uh, an attempt, I guess, to draw on various different sorts of models of government funding to think about how we might do things better in the social services. So there's the Farm Act model. Which, which has a very, very strong investment approach to the selection and funding of pharmaceuticals. Uh, the ACC um, uh, model of funding uh, people who've suffered accidents and so on, and uh, the rehabil rehabilitation processes and so on, uh, have been thought about as, a, as, as being relevant, at least in some sense, for the social sector. So all those things have kind of set the contextual background for the development of this so-called uh, social investment model here. In my view, we've, we've had, in effect, two models of social investment. The first initial model in 2011-2012, and then a, a somewhat modified version, which is still evolving. That first model involved a, a strong focus on reducing welfare uh, dependency. In other words, reducing the number of people on benefits, specifically and trying to improve the government's long-term fiscal outcomes with a, a less, lesser emphasis on improving, if you like, social outcomes, a strong emphasis on fiscal outcomes, the Crown's balance sheet and, and the overall expenditure. Um, in that regard, there was a strong emphasis on the use of actuarial analyses to calculate the long-term fiscal vi uh, liability for different categories of working age welfare beneficiaries, as had been uh, recommended by the Welfare Working Group. So that meant, in effect, um, using an actuarial analysis to, to work out what are the costs to the state, fiscally, of uh, particular categories of welfare beneficiaries, for example, solo parents, um, solo parents of a particular age and so on. What are the fiscal costs of someone in that category uh, for the state over time? Uh, and then thinking about, well, some categories of beneficiaries are far more costly than others, uh, should we perhaps be dedicating greater resourcing to reducing uh, the numbers of people in those particular benefit categories? And if so, how? Well, uh, particularly through the use of active labour market policies. So uh, as part of this approach, um, WINS was given a mandate to place a greater deal of emphasis on reducing uh, certain categories of welfare be beneficiaries. And um, that was sort of prioritised in its overall performance management system. In this early approach to social investment, um, I think we can see it as kind of um, very fiscally driven, actuarially driven, and focusing on what one very senior public servant described as surgical interventions to assist vulnerable pe people. So a very strong focus on kind of small, narrow interventions funded through a range of organisations. Many uh, of you in this room will be involved in that. Uh, focused on vulnerable people. And that's very, very different from a broadly based conception of social investment of the kind that you would find uh, in Europe, which is, which is about um, uh, sort of more uh, universal rather than tightly targeted uh, forms of assistance and a broader range of interventions. But we've seen a, a gradual shift, in my view, over the last two or three years in the social investment approach here in New Zealand. And 
that's involved a broadening across at least four sort of dimensions. The first is a broadening of the target population beyond working age beneficiaries to include other people, children, um, criminals, etc. Secondly, a broadening beyond the Ministry of Social Development to a wider range of governmental agencies. Thirdly, a broadening of goals from a primary, if not exclusive, focus on reducing the government's long-term fiscal liability to a greater concern about other uh, social goals and a broadening of a focus on um, the total number of people on uh, a main benefit to uh, a broader concern for outcomes for vulnerable people, including children, more generally. So a slight broadening there, though it would be fair to say still um, a strong fiscal driver uh, and, and perhaps not a great deal of clarity about exactly what uh, the government is really wanting to achieve in terms of social outcomes. And then fourthly, a broadening of the analytical tools used to underpin and inform the social investment approach. So a move from a reliance primarily on actuarial analyses to a greater reliance on other forms of evidence, other kinds of data, through this um, uh, sort of integrated data infrastructure, which that's New Zealand has been establishing, which draws on a, quite a wide range of databases, um, <clears throat> enabling greater uh, data matching and better information for decision making. In addition, of course, we've seen, and you folk, many of you have been at the coalface of this, uh, attempts to change modes of commissioning and contracting, a move from uh, uh, results, sorry, from an output-based mode of contracting towards a more outcome-based mode of contracting, uh, which obviously poses a variety of serious challenges for many organisations. Uh, we've seen uh, the establishment of new entities within government, initially the Social Investment Unit, now the Social Investment Agency, and we've had the appointment uh, more recently of a Minister for Social Investment and the establishment of a, of a new Social Investment Board. So we're beginning to see uh, 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 changes in a variety of dimensions, if you like, of social investment and the building of a, of a more complicated uh, architecture to, to implement uh, social investment. Okay, quickly on some design issues, and I'm going to be very quick here. Um, the, the social investment approach, as it's emerged in New Zealand and as it's evolving, raises a variety of methodological issues, uh, implementation issues, it raises issues of a political economy nature, and it raises, I think, some fairly fundamental issues about how we should go about designing social policies in a context of a great deal of ignorance. So let me just make some very quick comments about this. Does social investment work? And how would we know? Is it possible to know what works? And what are some of the challenges in determining what works? Well, I think, as a social scientist, there are huge challenges in determining what works in the social sector. That's not to say we live in complete ignorance, but it does mean we have real and, and very significant limitations to what we can know. And here are some of the reasons uh, why I think uh, we have some constraints. Constraints that are, I think, going to remain with humanity for a very long time, notwithstanding huge technological advances. First of all, there are information gaps. We only have data on certain types of things that people do, certain sorts of things that befall them. Our knowledge is necessarily partial and fragmentary. And what we know about individual A may be significant, but we may not know much about how they interact with other people, other people within their whanau or community, and how much those interactions matter. Secondly, we have real difficulties in terms of causality and attributing um, cause and effect. Uh, in the social sciences, unlike some areas of the natural and physical sciences, uh, the relationship between inputs, outputs, and outcomes is often very hard to work out as I'm sure many of you will be aware. So we have a limited amount of information available on how particular interventions actually work. How do they actually induce desired behavioral changes? 
Third, we have difficulties in predicting what a particular intervention will do, not least because of the issues of <coughs> limited understanding of causality. And an attempt to develop you know, sophisticated risk predic prediction instruments poses some very serious uh, analytical challenges and also uh, ethical challenges. We are faced with um, uh, many situations in which we have significant numbers of what are called false positives and false negatives. That is to say, situations where um, we wrongly identify people in a particular category, or we fail to identify people who should be in that particular category, uh, potentially with very significant uh, implications um, for them and, and the community as a whole. Then there are issues of quantification. In terms of working out the costs and benefits of any particular intervention, um, it's often hard to ascertain what all the costs are. We may be able to ascertain to some degree what the fiscal costs are at a particular time, uh, but that's going to be open to debate depending on the discount rate we use and various other uh, assumptions that we adopt. Uh, but there may be other costs that are very, very hard to, to determine. The costs on the whanau, the costs on the wider community or whatever. Likewise, determining what the benefits are are uh, equally uh, often very difficult. And even if we can identify categories of costs and benefits, it's often very difficult to put a monetary value on those costs and benefits. And indeed, some people think it would be wrong to monetize the costs and benefits. So, so there is that sort of challenge. Then we have limited analytical capa capacity, if you like. There's only a certain amount of money allocated to doing really good research and evaluation. And so, again, we're always going to have limitations uh, uh, and constraints as a result of that. Uh, then there are issues around, if you really do want to investigate carefully what impact a, a particular policy intervention is having, you need a degree of stability because the policy may take some years before you can reliably determine uh, its, its overall effects. In fact, it may be decades. Yet, yet we're in a context where governments typically don't want undue policy stability, they want innovation and flexibility. But that immediately limits your capacity to undertake rigorous evaluations. Because if many bits and pieces of the overall architecture are constantly changing, how do you determine you know, which bits are having what effect on what and so on? And, uh, and that all adds up to us having significant difficulties determining the relative cost effectiveness of different policy interventions. Then there are a whole series of implementation issues. And uh, I'd be keen for us to talk more about this in question time. So I'll be, I'll be very brief at this point. But simply to say, uh, there is a, uh, a debate, which I'll come back to shortly, between whether we should have sort of top-down models or bottom-up models. In other words, kind of command and control models of, of social investment as opposed to kind of bottom-up bottom uh, ways of doing things. There are big issues about how we should think about um, commissioning and contracting. Um, and in that regard, you know, our capacity to evaluate, our capacity to work out uh, what the relationship between inputs, outputs, and outcomes is, needs to affect the kind of contracting we engage in. Uh, otherwise, we risk designing types of contract that are, A, extremely complicated and costly to, to, to implement and very, very hard to manage which takes us to the high transaction costs and compliance costs and so on. There are some huge privacy issues that the social investment approach has raised, and I'm pleased that the government appears to be slowing down in its approach to demanding uh, client-level data um, and beginning to engage with the social sector more earnestly uh, and seek advice uh, before it proceeds too far down this track. And then there are real issues around resource shifting. If, if governments are going to be shifting resources on the basis of new evidence about, quote, what works uh, from one sector to another sector or from one organization to another organization or from one particular intervention to another intervention, then obviously that has major implications for many of you in this room. Um, if, if, if you don't have stable funding, uh, that will have implications for your capability. Um, if you're required to shift your resources from one location to another location and one group of clients to another group of clients, uh, that obviously has implications for uh, the, uh, the nature of your work, uh, for staffing, um, for how you know, the organisation can operate and so on. 
Then there are a range of political economy issues, uh, and they include, first, the fiscal implications of social investment. Is this simply a, a way of saving money, or is the government going to be really willing uh, to invest new money if there is reasonable evidence that a particular intervention will generate better returns? Now, the government thus far has only allocated a very modest amount of, quote, new money through the social investment uh, approach. If it's really serious, and if it really believes the evidence that it's receiving, uh, then potentially it should be willing to spend a lot more. But we haven't seen much evidence of that yet. Um, secondly, there's the question of the scope of social investment. Is it going to remain narrowly focused on kind of surgical interventions, or are we going to think about it more broadly? And if so, what, what are the implications of that uh, for policy? Third, who has power in the social investment approach? Who's exercising power? Is, this, is, this, is, is, is power being increasingly sort of centralised, uh, or is it being devolved? My sense is it's perhaps being, being centralised. And then there are questions of political risk management. What happens if things go wrong under a social investment approach? Who, who holds the, who takes responsibility, and um, so on and so forth. Okay, this leads on to um, the question of, of learning systems and their limitations. What is the appropriate policy response to living in a complex world with a lot of uncertainty and with limited knowledge? What should we do? Well, one could say, simplistically, perhaps there are two broad approaches. One would be a top-down model, which I've referred to briefly already, and the second would be a bottom-up model. The top-down model would be to say, OK, the best way of handling complexity, uncertainty, limited knowledge, is to seek more and better data, more and better evidence, and reduce the level of uncertainty, and then to focus on building the capacity of the state to make intelligent investment decisions, to prioritise and then to direct resources in a very specific kind of way and to use its coercive capacity through funding to achieve particular outcomes. An alternative approach, if you're faced with complexity, uncertainty and limited knowledge, is to say, well, actually, there are real limits to any top-down approach. We need a more bottom-up approach. We need to draw on the wisdom of the crowds, to use a phrase that uh, is often used in the social sciences. This is the idea of relying more heavily on the knowledge of lay people, you and I, people actually involved in the uh, delivery of, of services to draw on their experience and expertise, to use multiple methodologies rather than a single methodology, to engage in long-term relational contracting based on trust rather than highly specific sort of classical contracts. I note that Prue referred to the importance of trust in one of her uh, responses to one of the questions earlier this morning, um, and so on, and to use a lot of trial and error and experimentation and so forth. Now, the top-down model and the bottom-up model aren't necessarily completely at odds. One can have a mix, potentially. I don't see much evidence of a bottom-up model so far with the social investment approach we've taken here. It seems to have been very much a top-down approach. The government has not consulted widely uh, on the development of the model or its evolution. Um, so far as I'm aware, <laughs> you know, it hasn't been holding national hui uh, on the social investment approach and getting feedback from the people at the coalface. So if we're in a world of complexity and uncertainty and limited knowledge, and if there are limits to our capacity to make wise decisions at the centre, surely we should be drawing more heavily on a bottom-up approach than we have hitherto. Finally then, what are some of the issues for social investment? Uh, what are the, some of the implications of social investment for the social service services and you folk in this room? I've already touched on, on these, but these are, these are some of the issues obviously that um, uh, are critical and will need constant engagement over the coming years, all the more so I think if the current government remains in office. First of all, how does one exercise some bottom-up influence on what is happening uh, in Wellington? What are, the, what are the mechanisms for influencing uh, the design of the regime that we have uh, and influencing the way funding is prioritised, uh, 
uh, and, and resources are allocated. Um, and it may be we need a more considered approach from the bottom <laughs> to influence the top in this regard. Um, secondly, what is the likely impact of reprioritization of funding? And, and how do we mitigate some of the negative consequences of that? If funding is going to be reprioritized between funders, between sectors, between regions, between different types of activity and so on, well, how do we, how do we minimize some of the downside implications of that? Do we try and s slow things down a little bit so that the changes are more gradual? Uh, or are there other ways of addressing the problems? What kind of contracting should we be seeking? And, and to what extent should we be open to different models of contracting and different different areas. Uh, what do we know about the kinds of contracting uh, that work best? And uh, how can we ensure that those models are more widely used? Data issues. How do we protect privacy in the context of uh, a world in which so much more information is available um, electronically uh, in a context of much greater data matching and so on? How do we, how do we protect uh, data privacy. I was intrigued uh, by the incident involving Winston Peters last week. Uh, intrigued at a number of levels. The first was that uh, the information about his superannuation arrangements was, it seems, almost immediately <laughs> transferred up the hierarchy to the chief executive of, of MSD. If, if I was Winston, would would, would, would my information have been immediately transferred up the hierarchy? Is that appropriate? And, and then it was transferred to the State Services Commissioner and through a process of consultation with the Solicitor General to both the Minister of Social uh, Development and the Minister of State Services. Personally, I find that disagreeable. I, I see no reason for that kind of information to be made available. And to me, it raised questions about <laughs> social investment. You know, how are we going to control who has access to what information? If the personal details of a mistake by one individual in relation to super become a matter of ministerial knowledge, that, that's really concerning in my view. Very, very concerning. <laughs> capacity and continuity issues. How do we build greater capacity in the social service sector in a context of constant policy change, limited funding and so on. I think a really fundamental issue. And then of course there's the whole issue of the impact of all these changes on the people who matter. How do we ensure humane treatment of very needy people, vulnerable people, uh, in a context of constant um, redesign of systems, processes, funding regimes and so on. OK, future directions, just to conclude, obviously there could be a change of government. If there is, my sense is some model of social investment is likely to continue. Uh, probably even the language of social investment is likely to continue, not least because the term investment is a positive framing <laughs> of policy. Uh, it's very hard to be against investment, isn't it? Um, and, and social is a positive word generally too, so I can't see a different government abandoning social investment as a concept, uh, though I can see it wishing to modify um, the current policy framework, and I hope that people in this room will be part of the dialogue that contributes to any refashioning of the current model. You ought to be, and you should demand to be heard. Um, we need to be mindful that the social investment approach as it's e evolving is just one part of a very broad jigsaw puzzle. And we shouldn't be too fixated on this one part because there are many, many other uh, critical things that are going on in society at the moment. I mentioned technological change. There are many kind of creeping problems, demographic change, ecological, ecological challenges. Uh, there are new social movements emerging, new social pathologies emerging. We need to be mindful of all these other things that are going on. And we need to be mindful of the broad design of our welfare state uh, with its whatever. $50 billion spent on education, healthcare, and, and social um, uh, tra transfers and social services, not just uh, a, a, a very modest part of that, of that budget. And we need a broad systemic approach, in my view, rooted in fundamental human values, uh, 
um, including a quest for greater social justice, solidarity and inclusion, uh, uh, a desire to reduce poverty uh, significantly and permanently, and, and a recognition that all human beings uh, have equal human rights, notwithstanding what a Deputy Prime Minister said yesterday, which was, to be honest, a horrifying thought that a senior person uh, in that kind of role would suggest that we do not have equal human rights. Just incredible. Anyway, I gather the Prime Minister has put that right, so that's one, one lesson learnt. All right, thank you, and I hope we can now have a, a decent dialogue and questions and discussion.